Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women in Film at Sundance. We are delighted to welcome you to the first of our panel discussions here at the virtual festival. And we hope that you'll not only be energized and inspired by what you hear, but that you'll take the time to seek out the work of the creatives that we'll be spotlighting. In this session, we're going to be talking to Alexander Eckhart, music supervisor for the film Passing, which had its 2021 Sundance premiere last night. Based on the novel by Nella Larson, Passing follows the unexpected reunion of two high school friends whose renewed acquaintance ignites a mutual obsession that threatens both of their carefully constructed realities. As part of the creative team behind the construction of the dreamy, captivating world of Harlem in the 1920s, music supervisor Alexander Eckhart was responsible for curating a soundtrack of jazz music that accurately reflected the transition from Chicago-style blues and New Orleans brass bands to jazz orchestras in the Harlem Renaissance. She's worked across the entertainment industry, contributing skills to feature films, award-winning Broadway shows, and live performances. And as an electric slash acoustic bassist, Alex has worked with a variety of artists, including Sam Bareilles, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Cynthia Erivo, Billy Porter, Patti LuPone, George Barnes, basically everybody. <laughs> Joining Alex in conversation today is Kirsten Schaefer, Executive Director of Women in Film. Uh, as a quick note, this session is open for questions, so please drop any of those questions that you have for Alex in the, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Also, we do have live captions available this, for this session, so if you hover your cursor at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a closed caption option. You can click that and enable captions. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kirsten. Hello, good morning. It's great to be here. <laughs> I almost said it was great to see you all, but I realized that I only see Alexandra. <laughs> um, but we know you're there. So hi, hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're so excited to have you. I had the opportunity to watch the film yesterday. I, I saw the premiere and it's so fantastic. It's just it's so nuanced. There's so much happening there and the music is um, you know, really an integral part of the story. And I think also, you know, uh, a little bit of a story of its own. So I'm excited to hear more about how you put that together. Um, I thought we'd start by having you tell us how you came to the film um, when you joined the creative team um, and what that process was like for you. Sure, yeah. Um, actually, Rebecca and I had been friends for a couple of years. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, um, were introduced by a friend of ours named Dan Lipton, who actually contributed some piano to the film. But he and Rebecca and a drummer friend of ours would actually get together in New York every once in a while when our projects lined up and we had space to kind of creatively, we, we formed a band basically, and we would <laughs> play songs. Yeah, Rebecca's an amazing singer, if you don't know, but um, we played all these eclectic songs from Nina Simone to Arctic Monkeys and uh, Bjork, we would just make our own arrangements in this kind of dingy warehouse in Brooklyn that was just very old New York music vibe. So Rebecca, uh, one of the most recent times we met up, she told us about her directorial debut of Passing and that she had been working on it for years and trying to get it produced and that it was finally happening. And I kind of approached her and asked if she needed any assistance on her music team or anything. And it actually ended up becoming that I was the music team after that. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited because Rebecca and I kind of built our musical rapport, just playing together for all these years. And it, it was nice to, to collaborate on a different, like not performance style project. Um, I love hearing about that. Um... One of the things that I had read that Rebecca talked about was her inspiration, some of, some of her musical inspiration uh, came from a woman, uh, Imahoy, I'm gonna let you say her full name. <laughs> Imahoy Sege Mariam Glebro. Yeah, uh, amazing. So she's a nun who um, <clears throat> uh, plays piano and wrote these incredible compositions and Rebecca, in an interview that I read said that she listened to them the entire time she was working on the script. Um, so when you came to the project, uh, I imagine she played that music for you. Um, mm -hmm. And so how did you, how did you figure out where, you know, where to place that music or work with her around integrating it? Yeah, that was actually the first thing that we spoke about is that she expressed that that was a huge inspiration for her in writing the script and she envisioned Ima Hoy's music throughout the film and various songs and we ended up going with The Homeless Wanderer which is what you hear the piano throughout the film but yeah she said that that was her vision for it and 
we it, it was kind of a saga to get it in the film because naturally she is a nun but she escaped religious persecution from Ethiopia, then became a prolific pianist releasing one album in the 60s and then gave up music altogether to join the nunnery. And she's now 96 years old and still living in a monastery in Jerusalem. So she has, I mean, there has to be a biopic about her story also at some point because she has a fascinating life, but her representation is obviously very, sensitive to what they allow her music to be featured in and the content and anything any violence or anything they don't want to be associated with that understandably so we kind of had to take a giant leap of faith and place her her music where we wanted to throughout the film show it to them and luckily they were thrilled and they loved how the music was used and they gave the a wholehearted permission and hopefully we'll get a screening to Imahoy in Jerusalem at some point, but yeah, it, I, it, it was a saga, but I'm so happy it worked out. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Um, and do you know how Rebecca came across that piece of music in the first place? I think she actually said that Tessa Thompson introduced it to her, if I remember correctly. And then she just couldn't get it out of her head and it, she just kept saying it was so timeless and I definitely hear that it, it sounds unlike anything really I've ever heard it's very pentatonic scale very bluesy but also a little bit of classical and you can tell there's a bit of archival in the recording which makes it that timeless feeling that she was going after to kind of be Irene played by Tessa Thompson's voice like her narrative throughout the film and it uh yeah it, it, that that's pretty much how that came out yeah it definitely matches or even drives perhaps that kind of the atmospheric feeling you know the for anyone who hasn't seen the film yet it opens with um uh, a kind of a blurry image of women's shoes walking along a sidewalk and then upstairs and then uh, the tessa thompson character comes into focus um and that music um accompanies that and and sort of sets that that tone of um you know moving between the kind of blurry and the and the sharp focus which is a, you know kind of a theme for the movie right where where there's a lot that's kind of happening um a lot that's unspoken that that's exactly. happening it's either coming that. through just the images and the characters you know expressions and then sometimes through the music Exactly. And that's what I loved about that particular piece being featured throughout because Irene is very closed off. She doesn't express what she's feeling. All of her emotions are held in until it builds up at the very end and you kind of see her unwind a little bit. But <laughs> it's nice to have that piece of music kind of be her her inner narrative and get get her her thoughts and feelings out and her anxieties about and uh, everything unspoken that she doesn't really project. So, yeah. I imagine in the uh, audience for this Q&A, we have some um, emerging or aspiring filmmakers. Uh, so I think it would be really useful for you to talk a little bit more about how that process worked with, with Rebecca. Um, and um, so you, you started off, you knew that this piece of music was, was gonna be in there and then what came next? Yeah, so this piece of music was definitely the priority, like it was her entire vision for the film. So it was necessary to happen, but then there was a bunch of other music in the film. There was on camera performances. There was four pieces of music in the town hall dance party scene that we had to, to um, source. Um, th there was a lot of, lot of music, but Rebecca has just such amazing taste in music and amazing ears so it was always fun to kind of bounce around different ideas and feel out her tone for each scene and she she just knows so much music so in my research for the film I would kind of look into old periodicals and old billboard charts and I kind of became obsessive about my my investigative research if you will but I would bounce some ideas to her some public domain songs that were very obscure and she'd be like I love that song let's let's do it let's go for it so that was super fun getting to to work with her and kind of throw her a little wild card here and there and just see what what would ultimately enhance the scene but also bring about again like you said the transition to swing music at that point it was such 
in a pivotal area era for like getting to the next step in music. We came out of the 1920s, early 1920s with Chicago style blues and New Orleans kind of brass bands like King Oliver and early Louis Armstrong. But during this time, Duke Ellington was just starting up and getting his jungle jazz kind of sound and Fletcher Henderson and huge jazz orchestras. So it was fun to explore that little middle section where the next part was. And so the film has, um, like you mentioned, those um, great dance scenes um, and all, also um, there's, there's some other music woven throughout, right? So there's the score um, and then there's also the neighbor who, the, the jazz musician neighbor that, you know, you often hear when they're on the, the front stoop and maybe even through the window in the mm -hmm. living room. Um, so how did you work with the, um, um, my understanding is that um, Dev Hines, Blood Orange did some of the, um, the composition. So how did that all fit together? Yeah, um, it's actually, it was a three-part kind of multi-layered score. It ended up being um, after we secured Imahoy. And we, I think we placed her 13 times throughout the film in various segments. It was, it was a lot, but it's like a seven minute song. So we had a lot to work with. Um, we had Dev Hines who came on, um, amazingly talented, and he added things here and there and certain drones and kind of more of a layering aspect, like textural mm -hmm. building on that when Irene would kind of, when she was losing control in the bed, when she took her medicine, it was both at the same time, which was a really interesting way to, um, to show her losing control in a way, but then we also had this trumpet player, this off-screen trumpet player character that was all Rebecca's idea. And it, it ended up being a very cool device for storytelling in that we never saw him, but he was a student. And in the beginning, he kind of started out practicing etudes. So I, I researched etudes from the era and incorporated that into those arrangements. But then you hear him kind of progressing and progressing and slowly building the Imahoy sound and referencing that and the key and certain trills in, in his playing. And he ends up becoming like a fully fledged player with his own voice. So it's really interesting that she had that idea to use that as a storytelling device. And we hear him throughout and there are scenes where he's talked about. So he's a character also. And I, I just love that. So, yeah. What was it like to work on, um, you know, a period piece and something this atmospheric? Like, how does this compare to other things that you've done before? Well, actually, this was my first film music supervising. What? <laughs> I hit the jackpot. Um, yeah, it was a, I had been very, very interested in it for a while. And I'd taken uh, a Berkeley class with Brad Hatfield, who's amazing teacher on music supervision. And I've always kind of just loved how music and film could work together just to make these amazing moments that you associate with these songs forever. And I knew that it was something I wanted to do, but as a musician, a New York City, like busy hustling, pounding the pavement musician, it's hard to kind of make both happen, but I've been studying it for a while and Rebecca and I just really hit it off talking about her vision for the film. And the Harlem Renaissance is one of my favorite eras for music and culture. So I loved getting to explore that more, but so my experience on this, I mean, I, I, it was stellar, you know, the whole team just working with these veterans of the industry was amazing and that it's at Sundance, I'm ecstatic, but it was fun making my debut kind of with Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, congratulations, because it, 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 um, it, it feels, uh, it, well, experienced, <laughs> you know, it, it, so, so, wow. so thank you very much. I appreciate that. It, a lot went into it and I, I really put my heart and soul into, into the music and of the film and building that world. And um, yeah, so thank you. You've talked a little bit about some of your inspiration and you were just talking a minute ago about the, the Harlem Renaissance as a, as a period and, and really loving that music. Uh, was there anything else that, um, that you drew from? 
Yeah, I mean, there there were a couple scenes that I definitely had some references for. Um, the first one is the scene in a speakeasy, which is where there's like a jazz combo, a four person jazz combo playing in these very close up shots. And Irene, who's played by Tessa, and Brian, who's on, played by Andre Holland, they're kind of silently sitting, kind of feeling each other, they're, they're husband and wife. But at that point in the film, there's a lot of tension between them and not really sure how each other is feeling about certain things. So I'll just leave it at that. But um, for that scene, we have this jazz band and Rebecca had referenced having a jazz battle. You know, when you go and see live music and live jazz, especially it has this frenetic kind of exciting energy of just solos and improvisation and just creativity. So she really wanted a, a battle solo scene. And we found this piece of music uh, that was public domain. It was very old, but a classic song, Bill Bailey, Won't You Please Come Home. And I found this scene from the film Paris Blues, which mm -hmm. was from the 60s with Paul Newman and Sidney Poitier. And there's this one scene where Louis Armstrong just comes waltzing in with a whole ba brass band behind him. And he kind of goes in and battles Sidney Poitier who plays the saxophone and it's just back and forth and back and forth. So that's kind of what we were trying to emulate for this scene. And um, that was really, really fascinating. And then the town hall dance party scene where I tried to kind of build an arc. There were four songs and that's when Claire who's played by Ruth Nega, who's stunning in this film and I can't even take it, but she's kind of re-exploring and rediscovering her African-American heritage that she abandoned to pass as, as white for the previous however many years. So I wanted to explore her excitement and bring kind of Irene's intrigue about her into that also. So I definitely relied heavily on my research for the Cotton Club performances and knowing what I do know and have experienced playing in my my own life about how set lists are built. So starting off strong in a fast BPM and kind of a major bright piece that kind of encapsulated her her wonderment at this situation and excitement. And then kind of going into the jungle jazz, especially when she's dancing with uh, the other character, Ralph, and we're all wondering what her motives are. So I found this amazing piece by this band called the Fat Babies that I actually heard while I was on tour a million years ago with In the Heights. And we were in Chicago and I saw them at the Green Mill and I loved them and kept them in the back of my mind since then. And they had this one piece called Sweet as the Night that really had the twisty, kind of snake-like almost characteristic in the the saxophones that like highlighted the suspicion and the just the intrigue in that scene and I just loved how that that synced up. Yeah I think that worked really well especially because that's by that point in the movie um, we're seeing um, Ruth Nega's character um, really at this um, sort of crossroads, right? Where she is, um, it's almost like by day she's living life as a white woman and by night she is with her friends, um, you know, and, and back in the, you know, where she grew up. Um, and the music I think is, is reflecting that back to us and helping us sort of get more deeply into that. That situation that she's in. Um, when you were working with Rebecca and the team, were you all having were you having conversations about um, sort of the themes of um, identity and race and colorism and um, that that are coming through and and how to reflect that in the music? Yeah, absolutely, and that definitely went into kind of our thought process behind the town hall scene, especially because thinking about both Claire and Irene's, Irene's frame of mind as they both live their own realities. And Irene with passing as, she used it as kind of an, a matter of convenience when she wanted to drink tea at the Drayton Hotel or shop at white associated stores. But she ultimately lived as a black woman with her family. And Claire, I was in her head thinking about what would she listen to? And she wasn't like, as a white woman in Chicago or passing as white with a husband who doesn't know that she has any African-American in her, 
what would she be listening to? Something like Paul Whiteman, kind of the more white versions of jazz, whereas Irene in Harlem would listen to something like Duke Ellington or again, like uh, Ethel Waters, all these famous singers of the day, like Adelaide Hall and what would she be seeing? Like uh, Shuffle Along was on Broadway then. I think that or Showboat was the first kind of African-American based theater. And it was all blowing up at the same time in the Harlem Renaissance. So I definitely took that into mind when I was thinking about their perspectives and what would excite them musically and uh, how to bring out that emotion in, in the piece, yeah. Um, I see there are a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm just gonna take a second here. Um, oh, here's a, here's a good question. Um, this is about uh, Imahoy's music. Um, it was used in a documentary last year uh, called Time by Garrett Bradley. Um, and uh, the question is, were you, were you all, was the team aware of that? And were you thinking about how the music was used in that versus how you might, how might you, you how might you use it in this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the time we were not aware. I, I just recently kind of became aware of that. I think I saw it on a top 10 score list to wrapping up the year but I, it's, it's on my list to check out and so we, we weren't aware of it but I'm sure it must be used beautifully but in a different way since that's a documentary and we're kind of using it more as the voice of a character but I'm very excited to, to see that and I'm excited to know how it fit in. There's another question here from Bradley Hatfield about um, the challenges of on-camera performances uh, with the musicians um, both in production and in post-production. Yes, so we had some interesting, uh, we had some experiences with that because there were two, again, the speakeasy scene, we had these two pre-recorded songs that we were going to feature because out of the four on-screen musicians, I was allowed two actual musicians because the the shots were so tight and I just felt it was really important to get the exact fingerings and breathing of the trumpet player you know when they're not playing you know or I, I know it definitely comes across when it's it's mimed so that was really important to me to bring the live authentic jazz aspect to that scene but because we were only allowed two live musicians we had to do some pre-records and then we ended up being in post-production right as the pandemic hit and those scenes needed a little bit of retooling and the, there was some public domain nebulousness, let's say. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and I ultimately produced new sessions from home with everyone remotely. So these four jazz musicians that are just really close buds of mine and luckily they took on the challenge, which already is a challenge. But with this, we were matching the audio to the visual. So we kind of reverse engineered the music to the scene. And uh, they sent us back a bunch of different audio tracks. I sent them arrangements and the music editor on the film, Chad Birmingham, who is just the ultimate, most fantastic human. We kind of tag teamed this whole scene and we edited each audio track individually so that it sounded soloistically kosher from the time. And then we put them all together so that there are no clashes and kind of we wanted to build musical phrases and have it feel realistic and that they were actually they were listening to each other and it was all happening live and still get that that exciting feeling of improv but have it fit the visuals and sync up just so so that the breathing lined up and the fingerings and everything like that so that was definitely that was definitely a challenge, but I'm, I'm so happy. It was uh, such a fun project. We, we loved getting to explore that. And then in the town hall scene again, where we have this giant jazz orchestra kind of emulating the Cotton Club and Duke Ellington, that was all background actors. So mm. we basically just handed them certain period appropriate instruments. And I went around to each of them once I saw the terror in their eyes of how do I hold a trombone or how do I play a trumpet or mime it or anything. So I gave them all individual tutorials based on 
mm. what instrument they were playing and just to, to have them feel comfortable and to have it look realistic. And you can bet I went to town on the acoustic bass guy. We had a bit of fun giving him an actual <laughs> technique lesson, so. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, there is another question from um, Veronica Miles and her question is, what sort of tools research support can directors provide to help music supervisors with their process? Wow. Um, well, Rebecca and I, Rebecca is very, very clear. She knew her vision, I guess, just with all the years building up to this project, she, she knew exactly what she wanted. And we, we definitely had a very collaborative relationship and just talked very openly about each scene and the tone of each scene and what she wanted to emote with the music and certain layers that she wanted or certain textural elements for the piece. So it was really great getting to just have an open communication with her and with the producers. And it, it, I would just come up with different options for her based on my research and based on my take on the scene and pitch a couple ideas. And she would be like, oh, well, I like the song, but maybe a little bit more exciting to kind of clash with the moment. Or there was a piece at the end where Imahoy was fading out and she wanted a very busy kind of horn song to show that the final kind of scene was about to take place and that mm. it was about to blow up. So she wanted it to clash a little bit more, which wasn't my initial idea for it, but I see exactly why she wanted it. So she would give me notes and we would kind of just incorporate those back and forth. And she, she's just fantastic to work with. She's an awesome person, very open, very warm to discussing different ideas. And she's, she's super musical. So that also really, really helped. So that's a good lead in into this question from um, an anonymous attendee. <laughs> what were the most difficult parts of the job? Um, and what, were you also doing the licensing and clearance and, and was that difficult? Yeah, no, I did everything. I did the, the licensing and clearances. So uh, actually Imahoy was my first clearance mm -hmm. on the film and ever. So that was very interesting uh, because it was months long. Um, because that, that, that was the first piece, again, that Rebecca knew she wanted. So before even pre-production, when we were just kind of talking about the film and I was reading through the novel and that came up as a major part of the, the film for her. So we, gotten, we reached out early and just expressed our interest and kind of told her rights holders the idea about it. And it ended up being like months, months long after filming, after post that we put everything in the music and that's when it all came about. But that was definitely, that, that, that was a, a challenge. The speakeasy scene, yeah, having to retrograde and build kind of a jazz Frankenstein afterwards and make it feel like it was breathing and living in the moment. That was definitely also a challenge but it but it, it was so much fun like everything that came up was really fascinating to explore and I feel like my musician background definitely got used a lot on, on this film you know just from that scene where I got to record people and produce the sessions and make custom arrangements out of these songs to editing it and logic and working with the editor and um yeah, just 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 trying to to build this world and working within the budget and being just creative and resourceful to the best of my ability was was really awesome and juggling the different worlds of production and music. So I like to kind of straddle that and be able to kind of be the translator almost like the way I think about being a musician, specifically a bass player is that you want to be the glue that holds everything together. Like I listen to the drummer and I listen to everyone in the band and you try to find the pocket, so to speak, is what we call it. So in my approach to supervision, I wanted to find that pocket also and just listen to everyone's perspectives and feel out the scene and just really use, use both of those different brains, my left and my right brain to kind of 
open up the film in that way. I'm going to echo a comment from um, an, an audience member who's saying that um, you being a, a professional musician was an incredible added value to your role and that they were really lucky to have you. I mean, when you were describing that, um, <laughs> how you were telling the background actors to hold their instruments, I was like, oh, that's probably not a usual role of a music supervisor, but so great that you were there to do that. Yeah, it was really, it was, I didn't expect my musician person to to kind of come up in so many different ways like angling the piano so that when the lid is open it projects to the audience and not to the wall having to kind of make sure that happened or you know <laughs> once there was in kind of a an electric instrument brought on from one of the the scenes and I was like I don't know if we were there yet in the 1920s so let's try to go towards the banjo maybe which was era specific and period appropriate. So yeah, I mean, there were so many ways that that my musician background came up that I was very, very thankful for. Music supervisor slash prop master, it sounds like. <laughs> On the down low. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so there's a question here that, first I'm gonna ask you a clarifying question. Are you also an actor? I am not an actor. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to ask this differently then. So um, Lindsay is asking how your experience on Broadway, and I think maybe what she means is, um, you know, being a professional musician playing um, in the, the variety of places and kinds of shows that you've played in. Um, how did that inform your experience as a music supervisor? Um, and what did you which I think you've talked about a little bit. So let's focus on this. What did you learn from being on, on production um, it, you know, as part of the production that you'll take with you? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, the live production from Broadway, there are definitely similarities to, to film production, I find. And the, the difference is that obviously Broadway is happening live for audiences and you're seeing what's happening for better or for worse, but knowing how all the cogs and the machines kind of work and watching that over the years and being able to build different uh, books in, in all the shows I've played, like playing the band's visit or the Book of Mormon or in the Heights or anything like that, you kind of get to bring your own experience into that. Like there is a book, there is music and you have to abide by that, but getting to also you know, it, it just just listen to everyone and have your own voice in that, but within the world. That really helped mm. to in my work on the production because obviously we are in the Harlem Renaissance for this. So we want to stay in, in that sonic vibe and that cultural vibe. And it, I definitely used my production knowledge from Broadway to incorporate that and to build my idea, I guess, my and Rebecca's idea of what this life would be like for them living in Harlem 1929 and about to hit the depression and the idea of passing and identity and just belonging, how that felt and how that mixed in with the, the music and the culture of, of it all. I don't, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but here we are. <laughs> um, that was a great answer. Um, I'm going to switch um, gears a little bit. And there's a question from Francine, who's asking, um, who does a music supervisor work most closely with on the filmmaking team? So obviously you work with the director, Rebecca Hall. Um, and you've also talked about working um, with the, the composer around around elements of the score and also around with musicians is there anyone else on the team that you worked with yeah um i worked very very closely with chad birmingham the music editor during post-production and you know having the added element of quarantine and everything was just starting to hit and we were all kind of a little panicked about how to make everything happen because we it, it felt like there was there was a bit to do and Obviously everyone was panicked <laughs> at that point, but I worked very, very closely with him and he was a great resource and a great just just teammate in the whole um, 
process, but definitely, definitely Chad, Rebecca and I were, were talking all the time about the various scenes and songs and it, it was fun getting to explore that, that with her. Um, Margo Hand, who is the, one of the lead producers is amazing. And we would talk all the time also. Um, yeah, there, there were, there were a bunch of people. I think those were my, my main, my main peeps, but Jennifer DeLulo, who is the post-production supervisor. She also was great to work with. Um, yeah. And then the musicians, you know, having to really ask for a solid, uh, favor from, from a bunch of my buds and, and try to have my engineer hat on and my producer mixer hat on, which was, was an exciting element too. Here's a question, another question from Francine, who is asking if you have advice for songwriters who are looking to get their work in front of supervisors. Yeah, um, I mean, it's funny, with, with this being my, my first experience in a very specific era, it was interesting to kind of find, especially with the live music stuff, we needed to replicate 1920s. 20s early period jazz trad jazz but it, it couldn't be the old um recordings because it needed to sound live and not archived so we were i was very searching far and wide to find new bands that did that in the same style as the old bands and had the exact same instrumentation and all of those elements and played specific songs as if they were from that time, which is really, really hard. And there aren't that many. So I would just say if to keep doing your, your style and your genre, and it will fit something. <laughs> and um, you never, never know. Like when I saw the fat babies at the, the green mill, I had no idea that a decade later that would come in handy. I just loved it at the time. And I thought it was perfect. And I think I actually may have sat in with them, which is funny to think about, but um, they, it ended up just being exactly what I needed for this. And so you really never know, just keep doing your own style, I would say. And if something lined up, uh, if, if a certain plot of something excited you and you felt like your music felt right for it, I would just send it out and I'd be happy to listen to anything. I'm, I'm a music junkie music snob as far as I can remember my old family's musicians so we definitely uh just always listening so I would just say send it out and see who who responds and maybe it'll fit one day and you, you never know there's a um really lovely shout out coming from Chad at Birmingham who was the music editor who is um letting us know that it really is Alex's deep knowledge of music that was able to pull all you know make all this happen um, and he says that he's never worked with a music supervisor who finds her own source cues, writes the licensing agreements, arranges the songs, writes charts for live recording sessions, uh, shows musicians how to hold their instruments. Um, and it was incredibly fun to work with you. So. Oh, Chad, <laughs> yeah. Birmingham forever in my heart. <laughs> that means a lot. There's also a thread um, uh, about how people can watch the film. So, um, it did premiere yesterday on the online platform. Unfortunately, only for the U.S. The um, the, the festival films, um, I think, with the exception of, of some of the shorts, maybe are only playing um, in in the U.S. region. It's a whole technical thing. Um, I think it is. So then it the way the platform works is that you watch the premiere, and then the next day it goes up for I think. 24 or 48 hours and people can buy tickets. I'm seeing that people are saying it's sold out. Um, so we need this film to get picked up by a distributor, which I'm sure it will. And um, hopefully will get released quickly. So when it does get released, we'll make sure to put it, include it in our weekly newsletter and, and blast it out. And also we have a recording of this. So perhaps we'll be able to, to show it again. Um, yeah, so so we'll keep people updated and then you guys can also look look for it yourselves. Um, let's see. 
Here is a question from Robin, um, who's asking if this is, if you want to continue on this path of music supervising and continue to work in either film or television in, in this realm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I kind of just became enamored with the whole process of it. I love the creativity of it. I love the, the business aspect of it. I love the collaborative aspect and getting to work with people and such thoughtful artists behind this and uh, getting to really do my part in building this sonic world for this film and I just I just it's the same way that I think about playing also it's like every concert or every show I really put my all into it and I really put all of my previous experience into that and I, I just love I just really loved it and found the whole production just a special place to be in and I definitely am am eager and excited to do more and I hope everyone loves passing and that it's kind of builds that momentum and yeah I'm I'm definitely would love to to keep on this track great we hope you do too and that we get to see and hear more from you um, here's a, a technical question, which is, um, did you clear all the media throughout universe for um, perpetuity uh, or limited festival rights? Yeah, we did it. Um, every, we went the whole thing in perpetuity throughout the universe. Um, when we were talking to the producers or when I was talking to the producers about it, they really have high hopes for the film and they want it to be an awards contender and go the, the full full out. So. We, um, yeah, we got it, all, all the rights we obtained. So, yeah. Good job. I think it has a, has a great chance of um, uh, awards. Um, hopefully it'll get picked up quickly. We'll see it um, released. Um, I keep hearing that there's the, the streamers in particular are, are, are gonna run out of content <laughs> because there'd been no production this year. So hopefully we'll see it quickly and um, then you'll actually, be back on the award circuit. Yeah, I mean, actually on that note of uh, clearing everything and having to do it throughout the universe with all this public domain music, music, it was kind of a swirly process in that the music's been around for so long and been transferred so many times to different holders and different rights owners and different publishers that that was very important to do a deep dive in copyright periodicals from that time and make sure that all of that was lining up because I didn't want to have anything, you know, I wanted to cross all my, my T's and dot all my I's, you know, so yeah, the, we got it for everything, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. Um, what, um, what are you working on next? Um, well, next I'm, I'm in, couple talks about some things that I'm hopefully can talk about at some point, but as far as music and live performance, I hope that comes back also and that I get to kind of incorporate both back into my life again, because it's been a real bummer. It's been almost a year of no, no music and no outlet for a lot of people and all of the, the theaters and venues are suffering and hopefully they get some help and we all get to go back to work soon and production and everything like that. Um, I do have a, just one other quick question I thought of when you were saying that, which is um, you talked about how you um, brought those musicians together over, I'm assuming Zoom or something to, to record it. Um, was that how you did that? No, we, so Chad and I worked out a system basically. We got a quick time or he made a quick time of this scene and he put streamers on to each time the musicians were on screen and you could see what they were playing and how they were fingering it and how they were breathing and kind of when to watch out for matching it up and making sure it's synced. And I sent them arrangements that I created for, for it just to make everything as easy as possible for everyone because it was such a crazy time and that's a lot to ask of someone even in normal times it's not like we could book a studio and go in for an hour and just do some re-records you know everyone had to have their own setup at home which a lot of people do to varying degrees but not to the kind of professional 
quality that we needed. So I um, sent uh, reference cues of uh, just a couple different, um, I think it was a Louis Armstrong version of the song and said, this is kind of how we want it to progress. Like here are the hits, here's everything and here's the scene so you can watch. And each, we started out with the piano because he was the basis for the whole piece and kind of the easiest one to follow. Then we went to the banjo to have all of our chordal instruments out of the way. Um, and then the trumpet player was the most featured in the scene. So Josh Evans, who is the most phenomenal player, he plays in Christian McBride's band. He's always at the Vanguard and just playing around. Mm -hmm. He's amazing. He took it on and just did an incredible job recording, I, I guess, in Logic or some with some kind of DAW station. Um, and they just sent it back to us and we worked from all those different, wow. all, yeah, all those different audio tracks, which sometimes they would send us like four or to like eight different tracks and we would go through them meticulously listening wow. to each one and being a little, maybe unhealthily obsessive about it, how it flowed, or maybe that was just me <laughs> listening with a, my, my musician ear, but yeah, so we built all them separately and then put them all together and make sure it's locked in with the visuals and um yeah it, it was it was a process it was fun that's impressive that's impressive um where i thought i was going with that question um but i'm so it was so great to hear that answer was um you know have you figured out how to play with other musicians during this time like either kind of safely in person or over any kind of a using any kind of a platform yeah, I mean, I've I've done all of the above. I've had some Zoom recording sessions, which are very hard because there's a lag and you're trying to play and everyone's trying to listen, but it doesn't really do it justice. I've done a bunch of recording from home. Um, I've gone to a couple studios to do some sessions, which is very strange feeling because everyone's masked and far away. And the whole point of being in a studio is playing together and being right. next to people and feeling their vibe and it's it's definitely something that I miss and it, it would have made this film in that particular scene a lot less challenging I think or less of an, an adventure if we could have been all in person but but you figured it out and you made it work you figured it out <laughs> <laughs> so congrats to you thanks there was also this other scene that we kind of incorporated those elements to the final scene um where Claire and Irene are at that party, if you remember, and uh, Claire's husband, who's played by Alexander Skarsgård, and he's just amazing and scary and just opinionated, let's say. Mm -hmm. But he'll, he comes in and kind of barges in, and we know that something is about to happen because the tension throughout the film builds up, and the just mysterious quality that Irene and Claire are exhibiting for each other because they're living such different lives but almost parallel in, in some senses because they both can pass but only one of them chooses to and they're both fascinated with the, the how, how it, with each other's lives and almost want to live their lives and at, at that point uh we decided to use a song that was the only song with lyrics in the entire film. Mm -hmm. And I kind of made, made a point of that because I thought it was important at that, at that point in the film to speak, to have a female voice when Irene and Claire weren't saying anything. They were just kind of looking at each other, acknowledging what was about to happen and that they, just the consequences of both of, their actions and how they both chose to 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 live their their lives and in that scene I, I wanted to find a female voice so I looked through Ethel Waters and Adelaide Hall and Alberta Hunter who we actually used a version of her singing Someday Sweetheart which was just an amazing song the lyrics were about regret and longing and kind of like there there's one lyric that says I hope you're happy now kind of thing and it's like wow they both kind of both of these characters are finding how both of their actions 
left off. And I, I just loved how that piece came about. And also there are some personal elements to Alberta Hunter that lined up with these characters, which I thought was interesting too. Like Alberta Hunter lived in Harlem throughout the Harlem Renaissance and for so long. And then there was this, in the film, there's kind of, and the novel, there's an undertone of like sexuality between mm -hmm. an attraction between Irene and Claire that's never said, but you feel it the whole time. So yeah, you definitely do. Yeah, I mean, they're both stunning creatures, so who wouldn't? But you know, you feel it the whole time and that it's bubbling up and you don't know which element is going to be the reactionary thing that, that sparks the fire at the end. So Alberta Hunter was a, a closeted lesbian at the time also and kind of had her attraction to both men and, and women and it was kind of under the radar. And I just thought that that was a really mm. interesting parallel that I couldn't have planned to this, this particular plot, part of the storyline. So, yeah. Well, Alexandra, it's an incredible accomplishment. Um, I'm so excited for everyone uh, to see the movie and, um, and also to see what you do next. So thank you for joining us today and for sharing so many insights and also kind of tricks of the trade. Um, and we hope to have you back at another time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was awesome getting to chat with you and I hope you all get to see the film at some point. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. And um, we do have a couple of other um, panels happening today at WIF. So um, join us uh, for a, a panel on um, intimacy coordinators. And then we have another music supervisor panel later this afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.